Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. Okay, we're in the book of Acts. And uh, Steve, did you ever get it downloaded? Did you ever get that figured out? It's another, uh, another illustration of why not to buy an iPad. Uh, friendshipgracebrethren.com slash documents. And uh, if you're on an Apple device, you can uh, bring it down, but you can't save it. You're on an Android. You have an iPad now? E exactly. That's exactly the same problem. Right, because it's re-downloading it. And you gotta, you got to latch the one first. Yes? Wait, 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 wait. There you go. Because she's got an Apple II and can't figure it out at all. Do you want me to talk? Is that what you mean? Okay. So, friendshipgracebrethren.com uh, documents. We are in the section called Inception of the Church. We're almost complete with that. I anticipate getting through that this morning. Maybe not. Maybe. So let's begin at chapter 2, verse 41. We've, we've already been through the first uh, 40 verses, and we'll get to, uh, verse, uh, to the end of this uh, chapter this morning. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they've devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Okay. So in the very first sermon preached in the church age, 3,000 people responded and uh, were saved. That's kind of a remarkable beginning, isn't it? They, those who believed were uh, uh, baptized, or, wow, could you speak maybe? Obeyed and were baptized, acknowledging their identification with the triune God in their salvation. So the question I have is, how does baptism identify us with the triune God? Yeah, I said that. Throw the, so the, the command by Jesus was baptize in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Spirit. So the answer to the question, how does baptism identify us with the triune God? They're all mentioned, all members of the triune God are mentioned in the, in the baptismal formula. You guys should know that one. What did these new Christians do initially as a group? Yeah. <laughs> Attending the temple together. In other words, continuing in their religious system that they were in. We miss this all the time, don't we? Because we think that... that they stopped being Jews. But here, Dr. Luke tells us, attending the temple together, 
And then, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with gladness and generous hearts. In other words, they, they continued in their, in their Jewish tradition, because these were mostly Jews, or all Jews at this point, and they continued going to the temple and continued learning um, from Old Testament sources. But then they got together and worshipped together and fellowshiped together and had um, what we believe was the beginning of the threefold communion service in their homes regularly. Um, most churches in the early first hundred years of the church were small home churches. You know, even, even when, we, uh, when we read Corinthians, and, and it appears to be a, a rather large church, it probably was a gathering of, lo- of uh, many small home churches. Because the Christians didn't have a place, they didn't have a building that they could necessarily meet. They were, they were outlaws. And they had to meet in other ways, in other times. And much like the churches in, uh, in China today were their home churches, and they then worship together in small groups, and sometimes they're able to get together on larger groups. So the answer to the question, what did these new Christians do initially as a group, is continue in the process that they had already been in, and then built, built bonds with each other through their worship and fellowship and, uh, and study together. Breaking of bread is a phrase used in the early church typically to refer to communion, not just eating a meal. So when, when we read in the text that they were breaking bread together, typically that's what uh, is, is being understood. It's quite simple to see the initial practice was keeping the threefold communion which the apostles had experienced with Jesus just a few weeks earlier. They undoubtedly taught the practice to those who subsequently came to the Lord. 1 Corinthians 11, as well as many uh, patriotic, that means uh, early church father writer, uh, fathers uh, who were writers, indicate a meal preceded the bread and the cup. While no mention of the foot washing is made, that alone uh, does not mean they did not practice foot washing at the time. Thirty years later, the Apostle Paul would write to young Pastor Timothy to give him instructions on how to manage the church. Let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years old uh, of age, having been the wife of one husband and having a reputation for good works. If she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to every good work. Given the teaching of Jesus in John 13 and this instruction to Timothy, it would seem clear the reference is to the act of participating in foot washing, not simply in humble service as some attempt to make it. Add to this the teaching of many of the patriotic uh, writers, such as Tertullian from 160 to 225, Oregon from 185 to 255, uh, Pacamus 292 to 348, um, Chrysostrum 347 to 407, um, and a whole list of others that are in the notes if you want to see them. They all talk about foot washing as part of the of the regular communion service. As, as, as long into the period of time after Rome had become Christian and they began following new practices, foot washing was being written about as being the standard for the communion service. Explain the meaning of many wonders and miraculous signs by the apostles. Why did they perform these many wonders and miraculous signs? So we, we, read, in the, we read back in the text here. Maybe we did. Or three, I didn't, did I miss it? And it came together every soul, and many wonders and signs were, were being done through the apostles. What does that mean? What are many wonders and signs? Mm-hmm. 
Mm hmm. What else? Raising people from the dead. They were, uh, they were healing people. They were doing all sorts of things in the physical world from a spiritual power. And those uh, miracles were uh, to authenticate that they were teaching what was coming from God. Since the New Testament had not yet uh, been completed, and at this point not even been started, the miracle served as a method of showing God was behind this movement and what they said was to be or was revealed by God. It was a way of, of authenticating that they are actually God's messengers. Because how do, how do we authenticate today that somebody's God's messenger? Yeah, we, we, we validate what's being said. We compare it against what, what Scripture says. But the New Testament wasn't there yet. It wasn't even being contemplated yet. And so they had no other way to... Uh, to validate that. Does this passage teach that Christians should live in communes in which the group owns everything? Why or why not? Remember at the end of the, of the passage, it says that they held everything together and, and gave to each as they had need. That is the definition of communism. Is this a a biblical validation of that form of government. Right. Why did they have to do that? Yeah. Why did they need it? It's exactly the way it was. They had, to, they had to do this because they had no, way, no other way to care for each other. Because they were rejected by their families when they became Christians. They were outlaws, and so they couldn't just go into town and buy stuff. They, they, had, they had real struggles. And we'll, we'll see this develop over the course of the, the beginning of the book of Acts. Um, we get to chapter, chapter 5, and we see Ananias and Sapphira. Now, this was not mandatory. You, they, didn't, they weren't told, okay, in order to become a member of this group, you've got to sell everything and give us all your money. It wasn't mandatory. And Ananias and Sapphira, they wanted to make it look like they were, they were being very magnanimous, but they didn't want to give up all of their wealth. So they, they claimed that they sold their property for so much and they gave so much, but they actually sold it for more. And God said, no, you'll be just DRT, dead right there. And so they were. And so we'll see that continuing in chapter, chapter 5. Uh, this passage doesn't teach that uh, Christians should live in communes. We have in our own brother in history a commune in Ephrata, Pennsylvania. Linda and I visited the Ephrata cloister on our, uh, after conference this year on our vacation. And... Uh, it is, a, it is probably the darkest period of, grace, or of brethren history. Um, this one man who was an elder in a brethren ch church moved out of that and grabbed a, a, a big plot of land out in the uh, uh, Pennsylvania countryside, and he began to build houses there and separate the people that followed him from the world. And not only was it a... A, uh, a commune type facility. It was a bunkhouse for the men and a bunkhouse for the women. They slept on 18 inch wide boards, no mattress or anything, and their pillows were four by four pine blocks. Yeah. And they wondered why they didn't have kids. I could have told them why, but it, it's, it's incredible. 
And they had, at, at the height, they had several hundred people living in this commune that were separated from the rest of the world, except there were other followers that were already married that lived in farms around the commune that came there for worship, but they, they didn't live in the, uh, in the commune itself. Um, they would go to bed at midnight, get up at 3 to pray for an hour, go back to bed at 4, get back up at 6 to pray, no breakfast, go through their day of whatever their task was in the commune, break at noon for, for an hour of prayer, back to work, end of work at 5 for dinner, and six for prayer, and seven bed. That was their life every day. One meal a day. No, seven, seven to midnight is, is then prayer time. Sorry, yeah, in their, in their own room, yeah. So imagine that. One meal a day, and when you finally, after all of that work, you got to sleep on a four by four. True that. Yeah. We we actually got to sit on those beds and as the, the tour guide. Effort of Cloister is now owned by the I guess it's Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, not the state, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And the tour guide had a, had quite a bit of knowledge and and we got to sit there as they as he told us more about that. But that's part of our history. No, they're no longer out. They died out. Wonder why. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the last one didn't die until the into the 1900s. And this was this was uh, uh, pre uh, Declaration of Independence when they were there in the middle 1700s. They had kids and they had regular lives, but they they. They lived the same schedule, but they lived in their own homes and farms around the cloister. Yeah. yeah the, that, that's what I say. The last, the last descendant of the families didn't die until the, I think it's even into the 50s, 1950s. Some, yes. But the, the cloister itself had, had, had industry. The uh, they had a printing press, and uh, of course the brethren were the first to print to to print in English in in America um, Bibles and so forth, and they printed a uh, a, a hymn book that many um, many fellowships and churches used in the area, and that was all printed there at the cloister. They they had they had a tremendous printing. Um, set up there. They had one building dedicated to just doing, just, they had like, I've, if I remember right, four or five printing presses. It's not like what, you know, it's a single page, you lay it down and, and that kind of deal, but it was, it was an amazing thing to see it. And Pennsylvania has taken really good care of the buildings. Most of the buildings have been completely restored and are like what they were. These people must have been really short because there wasn't a door that was taller than this. So, but it was it was I've always wanted to go there because it is part of our of our history to see what that what that looks like and and this this uh this verse that they had all things in common um was one of the reasons that uh that the 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 guy that began the the cloister decided that it was something they needed to do. He wanted to get back to use his words, authentic Christian church. Anyway. What does meeting in the temple courts mean for the church today? Yeah. Yeah. So what were they doing? They were having Christian meetings in temple space. Yeah. 
Yeah, when everybody else was around, sure. So what would that mean? Well, you, they would be have to be separated here as well because you couldn't get into the temple. Women couldn't get into the same place. You had to, you had the, the the court of the Gentiles, and then you had the, the the ladies' court, and then you had the main temple outer court area for the men. So they would have to be separated. It means that they were putting themselves into into a position where they could influence a lot of people, where they they were not sequestering themselves hiding themselves in their own facility they were going out into the world and into the places where where people gathered so what the question is what does it mean for us today it means that we have to be out in the, out in the world we have to be active with other people in order to get an opportunity to potentially lead them to Christ we have to put ourselves out and not just retreat into our own protections that make sense Okay, good. The, the apostles of the church. And we're going to begin the first section, opposition to the church. So we're moving into chapter 3, verse 1. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. The Jews ritually play, prayed three times a day, 9 a.m., the third hour, noon, and 3 p.m., the sixth hour. Luke records the time of the apostles' prayer as a way of explaining later events. We'll see that in chapter 4, verse 3. Was it proper for Peter and John to still participate in the ritual Jewish system? We think most of the time that they didn't do that. I used to think that, that when they became Christians, they stopped being Jews. Clearly they didn't. Was it proper for Peter and John to participate in the Jewish ritual system? Yeah, the Apostle Paul and him and uh, Peter got into a, into a tiff about that. Paul called Peter out. You know, Peter, the, the head of the apostles, right? And Paul, the, the aftermarket apostle, if you want to call him that, you know, went after Peter and said, you, you're a hypocrite. Why are you acting one way with one group of people and another way with another group of people? So you're absolutely correct. They didn't stop being Jews. They continued in their Jewish ritual. They continued even in their sacrifices. Now for the church, that's real frustrating. Because we always think that when Jesus came and he died on the cross, sacrifices were over because he was the great sacrifice. Right? So we think that there's no reason for Jews to sacrifice anymore. They didn't believe that, but these guys did. The apostles did. And most, most Christians get real frustrated when they learn in the millennial kingdom, the temple is rebuilt and the sacrificial system starts again. You have the Messiah on the throne and you're going to the temple to make sacrifices. That just frustrates the church because it's contrary to what we understand in our in our time period I'm sorry worship yeah and, and in fact that's what we find out in uh, in in the millennial kingdom the sacrificial system is there to to uh, honor and to worship God for what he has provided not for for the appeasement like we see in the Old Testament but because the Old Testament sacrifice never saved anybody either. So it really doesn't change in the New Testament. You know, the sacrifice, sacrificial system continues until 70 AD. And it doesn't pick up again until the temple's built. And we don't have a temple. But we have a red heifer. 
if, if, you're, if, you don't, if you don't geek out on those things like I do, you probably haven't heard this yet, but the, the Temple, Temple Mount Faithful, I think that's the name of their group, in Israel that has all of their equipment made, everything ready, all of the ephod for the priest, everything ready for the temple system to begin, has been working on, for the last several hundred years, <clears throat> on getting another red heifer. Remember, it's from the ashes of the red heifer that uh, blessings come. And there, there are, there's rabbinic requirement for, for what the red heifer can look like. And at its birth, it can have no more than, oh, I forget the number now, I think it was 15 or something, some crazy number, uh, red hairs. I mean, uh, white hairs. Or non-red hairs. So it has to be totally red heifer. And then after, after it's a yearling, it has to again be examined by the, by the rabbis. And uh, so far, it has passed the first two tests. This, this new baby calf, I guess that's redundant, um, is red and has, has the, doesn't have any white hairs or any other color hairs. And they are all celebrating. We have the red heifer. So now they're one more step, a step closer to being able to reestablish the, uh, the Levitical system, except they don't have a place to do it. But they have all the material located within the confines of Israel to rebuild the temple, and they say they can rebuild it in less than six months. we be kind of cool. So the question, was it proper? Yeah, absolutely, because they were living under the rules. They were still living under the rules that required them to do those things. Their rules were not abrogated by the New Testament. For the Jew, they still had those things to do because they are ethnic Jews, not just religious Jews. They were under obligation to fulfill the, the, the prayers and the, and the worship and the, the taxes and the, uh, the sacrifices. Mm -hmm. what is the on the top of uh, the of uh, um, the Temple Mount, where today the Dome of the Rock and the Al Aska Mosque are, and Jews Jews have very little access to the top of the Temple Mount. In the uh, sixty seven war, they regained possession of the Temple Mount, and three days later gave it back. In this ill-conceived understanding that we can have peace if we give them land and give them stuff. It's ill-conceived because the Palestinians under their charter, the, the PLO and, and all the other Hamas and all the other groups, have in their charters the destruction of Israel. So you can't negotiate with somebody who, who's, whose life goal it is to kill you. That negotiation doesn't work. And uh, after they gained access to Old Jerusalem and to the Temple Mount in the in 67 war in 3 days they gave it back and so now they it the Temple Mount is controlled by a a an Islamic group out of Jordan and uh, the Jews have very limited access i've walked on the Temple Mount and seen all the the uh, Palestinian and, and Arab policemen there, the Jews don't stand a chance getting onto the mount. Every once in a while they'll get there and a riot breaks out. So um, they believe they can only build the temple there. They believe that's what, what God ordained, that the temple would be <coughs> on the top of Mount Zion, on the top of, of Mount Moriah, and uh, without, without building it there, it would be an improper place. Now, not every Jew believes that. There are, there, are a, there are groups of Jews that believe the temple actually could be in a different place, not in Jerusalem. Um, they're in the minority, and, and they don't have a lot of credibility behind their position. But. So Jews have not been able to offer a sacrifice since 70 AD, when General Titus destroyed Is, uh, Jerusalem and the temple. So now they're just hoping that God will save them. Um, they're not doing anything that they, they can't do anything to appease that. Verse 3, I'm sorry, 2. 
And a man lame from birth was being carried, uh, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. What was the purpose of placing the man at the beautiful gate every day? And was this a normal civil activity? Yeah, they were, they were hoping that somebody would come along and heal, heal them. And yes, it was a normal activity. This is called welfare in uh, 34 AD. The government didn't take care of you. Others had to take care of you. And so how were they going to take care of this guy? He could, lay, he could sit there and, and hold out his cup, alms, alms, and hopefully somebody would give him money and hopefully somebody would come along and heal him. That's just how they cared for each other then. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms, and Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and, and he said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Remember that. Dr. Luke is giving you a medical diagnosis here. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astonished, ran together uh, to them in the portico called Solomon's, Solomon's porch. So, what's, what really is the miracle here? Certainly, yeah. Well, he was asking for money. And uh, he, he, he thought he was going to get some money. But Peter said, I don't have any money. But how long had this guy been lame? Since birth. He never walked. Did you walk the first time you tried? No. Pretty much guarantee that the first few times you tried walking, you went waddle, waddle, bang. I mean, that's just the way it is. We don't, we're not like cows and horses that are born walking, right? We don't get to do that. We take months to walk. But here, he'd been lame since birth, never walked. So if you don't walk, what happens to your legs? They atrophy, or they never develop in the first place, if you're lame. So the miracle is more than just he was able to walk. He was able to walk and never had walked before. So God strengthened his muscles and gave him the coordination and maybe even the experience to walk because we learn to walk by experience. And so this was a big deal. I can't imagine what his emotion was like. Having never walked and then all of a sudden, poof, he has the ability to get up and to walk and actually put foot in front of the other and walk and not fall down and go boom. That's a big deal. And leap. and leap, yeah. I still can't leap. Gravity has a little to do with that. Maybe a lot to do with it. No, but we do have a picture of me in tutu and tights, so. <laughs> right, Pat? What's the purpose of the miracle? I think it's more than that. I think that's an easy answer. Well, he didn't know he could be healed. I don't know that his faith is really what's at question here. Because he didn't know. He was asking for alms. Hey, give me some money. Well, I got no money. I'll just make you walk.
It, it certainly helps them, yes. It certainly helps the, the apostles gel together. Did you see what Peter and John did today? You know, I can, I can see how that would work. But I think it's bigger than that. What happens immediately after this? Peter gets to preach on the steps of the temple. And all of Jerusalem gets to hear him preach. This poor guy was, was lame from birth to set up an opportunity for, pre, for Peter to preach in the temple. And the miracle was all about setting that up. Here this schlub had to, had to sit there for however old he was and get alms sitting at the temple gate just to set up Peter and John getting to, able to preach where everybody could listen. I kind of feel bad for the guy that he had to go through that. I mean, it's kind of like Job, right? Why did Job have to go through that? Not so he would learn a lesson, so we would learn a lesson, and so the people around him would learn a lesson. He had to lose his, his kids and all his wealth and everything, not his nagging wife, but everything else he lost. You know, it would have been nicer that his nagging wife had been taken, but that's not the way God did it. Why? So we could learn a lesson. Yeah. And that's exactly what happened with this guy. He was there just for God to, to prepare things. What was the result of the miracle? Everybody started to talk about it. And a crowd began to gather, and God began to bring together a bunch of people to listen to Peter preach. The God of Abraham, this is Peter now, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. So Peter begins his message to the people in Jerusalem by condemning them. He told them, listen, God was doing something and you killed God's guy. You took a murderer over him because you didn't like him. Peter identified, the G, identified Jesus, the one the Jews had executed. Remember, this is only a few weeks earlier. This is at most six weeks earlier. Notice that Peter reminds the Jews that Jesus was the servant of the same God they claimed to worship. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, their forefathers. He then reminds them that they rejected Jesus and asked for a murderer to be freed. It's in verse 15 that Peter begins to pour it on. He tells them that they had killed the originator of life. And you killed the author of life, whom God had raised from the dead. In what way is Jesus the originator of life? So that? Yeah. Is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah. Remember how it works in the triune Godhead. God the Father set the plan together and Jesus carried it out. So he's the author of, sal of, uh, author of salvation, but he's the author of life as well. The creator, sustainer of the universe that he then stepped willingly stepped into. Peter then uh, moves on to remind the gathered people that Jesus was no longer dead, but was raised from the dead, and they can attest to this fact as they are witnesses of the fact. They saw Jesus out of the grave. That's a, that's a powerful statement that they're making. Why is it important for the apostles to argue for the resurrection of Jesus and to remind the people they are witnesses of that fact? So that people know it's real? 
Why is the resurrection... Why does the early church focus so much on the resurrection? And not, say, his birth. We don't know precisely when Jesus was born. We know precisely when he died. Why the difference? Because now... Christmas seems to be more of a, of a big deal than Easter. But the early church focused on the resurrection. Why? Well, they've seen it. It's happened. True. That's exactly right. Salvation is dependent on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If he didn't raise, we're still dead. Paul said that. If he's not raised from the dead, we're to be pitied more than everybody. And so from the very beginning, the resurrection was central theme to the message of the gospel. That we, we believe a God who died for us, but didn't remain dead, was resurrected. No other... Religious system can attest to that. No other religious system has a God dying for us. It's us dying for them. And so it's, it's completely antithetical to everything that everyone else understood. If Jesus is not raised from the dead, salvation would not have been gained. Imagine if less than two months earlier... Someone came out of a grave here in Fort Myers. The city would still be talking about it. Because religious things were still going on in the, in the city. And so the, there was that rumor mill that uh, had been going throughout the city that the apostles had stolen the body. That something had happened to the body. And Peter's there saying, no... We saw him raised from the dead. We're witnesses to that fact. And, and it's important that you notice that he's talking about there's a plurality of witnesses. Dr. Luke would, would uh, or I'm, I'm sorry, the Apostle Paul would later say that there was more than 500 at one point that had witnessed him. And that's important in Jewish society because you begin to have some credibility when you have additional witnesses. And so Peter was saying, we're all witnesses to that fact. Yeah. Sure. What was the solution to that for, for the Romans or the Jewish authorities? What was the solution to quelling the, the argument that he wasn't raised from the dead. Show me the body. And nobody could show the body. So the, the, the Jews and the Romans had no argument. They had no way to defend their position. There was no body to show because it was still occupied by Jesus. Yeah, they, they certainly questioned the, the, the apostles, the disciples. But what did the Jews, or what did the Romans do to prevent the Jews from taking the body? They sealed the tomb and put a garrison of soldiers. A garrison of soldiers that was then liable for protection of the body, and if the body was gone, they were to be executed. And we know the body was gone because they actually paid off the, Jew, the uh, soldiers to not say anything. So it kind of... It, they, they, they argue against themselves when they, when they pay the, Jew, the uh, soldiers not to say anything. Because that, you know, they would have been under penalty of death. Oh, we got to stop. We got to stop. So we made it through verse 15 this morning. It was today the 14th. Any questions? I think this early section of Acts is, is fascinating. 
as we see two different kinds of worlds come together in, in a collision of the early church. Father, thank you for allowing us to spend time studying your word and seeing how, how you built your early church, how things changed as, as you moved through society. Thank you for men like Peter and John and, and their willingness to sacrifice it all to follow you and be obedient to you. Thank you for all that are here this morning. We trust that you would be honored and glorified as we seek to worship you and fellowship with each other. We look forward to a great service in the service to follow. Thank you for all that you do for us and for loving us in Jesus' name. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.